Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Today, we're here with the brilliant Dr. Doug Lyle. Thank you so much for being here oh, with you. Oh, my pleasure, Fiona. <laughs> Please tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your book, The Pleasure Trap, and your journey into studying the psychological side of health and addictions. Yes, uh, I actually was just a, trained as a general clinical psychologist, and uh, then I became an academic for a while. And after that, uh, I actually worked in criminal justice. So all this is in the background while my good friend, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, is trying to actually get sick people well. And so uh, I then joined him in the late 90s. He, he invited me up to join him at True North Health Center. And he said, listen, you're the psychologist. You're supposed to figure this out. Uh, they, the, uh, the guard, the, 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 uh, the folks that really know things had figured this out, starting with John McDougall and obviously building on the back of Pritikin and, and others. And then we had Esselstyn and Ornish and Campbell and, and Barnard. We got a bunch of great people. And these folks knew what to do and were obviously helping people have a lot of success. And Dr. Goldhammer was frustrated that he couldn't have more success than he was having. Mm -hmm. He was running into the obstacles that people do when they run into this problem. So he said, look, you're the psychologist, you figure it out. So we did the best we could. And uh, this is a very challenging problem. And it was actually Alan uh, who named it the pleasure trap. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, our, our publisher said, you guys have to have a name for this. And our name was previously survival or beyond survival of the fittest. And they said, ah, that sounds like a scientific thing. Nobody will ever want to read this. So uh, Alan one day said, you know what, it's a trap. And my people are in a trap and we don't know how to get them out of it. And it's the pleasure trap. It just came out of his mouth. And you know, it, it, stuck. it stuck. I like it. And that's what, we're, that's what we've been working on now for the last 20 years. Nice. So, so Alan um, said to you, listen, you're, you're the psychologist, you get into this. How did you really dive into, how did you make the connection? And, and where did you start? Did, did anybody teach you or did you do this yourself? Did you, you just figured it out yourself? The, the little bitty pieces. Yeah. Uh, I was reading a book called The Selfish Gene, which is a major work in evolutionary biology. And in that book, uh, Richard Dawkins, the author, talks about energy conservation. He just mentions it briefly in a passage and it almost matter of a factly. And, and I thought, my God, that's an unbelievably important concept. Mm. And uh, along with, pe people had talked forever about pleasure seeking and pain avoidance. And so we certainly knew that uh, hyper palatable foods, processed foods are super normal stimuli. They, they have a drug-like reaction on the system. They're hyper stimulating the dopamine pathway. This was known and uh, we knew that that's how drugs worked. I don't know how long we've known this, but at least since probably the 1980s. Yeah. The, um, but putting this together with pleasure seeking and pain avoidance, the, I was thinking what kind of pain are people avoiding? They're not avoiding physical pain by eating junk food, but they're avoiding psychological pain of, of essentially not going along with other people. So if we, if we start doing things in a healthy way, we wind up at odds with our friends and family, coworkers, acquaintances, we wind up in a battle and it turns out that battle is very often just too much for people unless they're well prepared. And so the pleasure trap is born of actually three parts of what we call the motivational triad. Those Under are my yeah, <laughs> understanding the pleasure seeking mechanism and how we get awry there, the pain avoidance mechanism being social pain and how to maneuver around the social problems. And then finally, energy conservation, which is the fact that we live in a world where it's extremely easy to eat unhealthy food and very more problematic and takes more energy to do it right. Mm. And so those three things constitute a, a sort of a, a three-pronged trap, and that's what we wrote about, and that's what we try to help people get out of. What is the ego trap? A, a number of years after, we were fortunate enough, John McDougall liked our book, and he, he actually said, you know what, you guys did a good enough job, I'll write the foreword if you'd like. Oh, <laughs> we said, nice. okay, we couldn't have asked for, yeah. for, we were extremely pleased and honored that he did this. The, uh, and then he came to us a year or two later and said, you know what, there's more to it than this. You know, he, he had thought about it and he just sensed that there was some kind of a psychological obstacle mm -hmm. that his people were running into. And the more I thought about it, I actually thought about a, uh, the problem of perfectionism, which is a major plague uh, that it, in, in human motivation that's talked about a lot in cognitive therapy. 
So there's a beautiful chapter in the classic work in cognitive therapy, which is called Feeling Good by David Burns. And the chapter is called Dare to be Average. Mm. And so I, I knew that in my clinical work for many things, I had been encouraging people to don't set the bar so high. Let's just see if you can do okay. Let's, let's start there. And that winds up being a useful tool to try to essentially keep people um, in what I'm gonna call an attack mode, uh, where they're willing to try. The, uh, the, the ego trap is where we feel like we've got too many chips on the line, where the expectations are too high. And it's so easy to, uh, once you learn about healthy living, it seems like a reasonable step that all you need to know is to learn about what the pleasure trap is, and then you should start to just execute it and lose 50 pounds, and then everything should be great. And it turns out that's not the way it works. The yeah. pleasure trap is actually far more difficult than we predict. And so if we have perfection as our goal, it turns out that very many people will fail and, uh, if they've conceptualized it in this way. And so when they fail, what happens is they'll kick over the table and just quit. And this is a devastating trap. Uh, this trap has also been explored in a different way by the uh, Stanford psychologist uh, Carol Dweck in what she calls mindset. So her notion is, is that we want to have a growth mindset. In other words, we're improving rather than a fixed mindset, which means we've already supposed to have arrived. Mm. It's really the, exactly the same notion. I just use slightly different language uh, to try to describe this because I think it's useful to not to, to conceptualize it as a trap uh, rather than a mindset. A mindset is it's as if we could just switch our mind about it in an easy way. It turns out it's it's uh, I think it's more useful to realize. Wait a second, this is a trap, and if I don't recognize it as a trap and I get this bar set too high and I have expectations for myself that are too high, then what's going to happen is that when I fail, which I inevitably probably will then I may just kick over the table and quit. And it's super useful to know that that's an additional landmine that sits in the way of, of the pursuit of any goal, but including healthy living. What is the law of satiation? What the law of satiation is, is the notion that we are designed uh, by an evolutionary process that is extraordinarily accurate. So uh, none of us are short of breath here. In other words, we, we uh, We've gotten, after all these years of breathing, we're not like 10 breaths short. Mm -hmm. And we're designed by nature to sleep satiation, although we can, we can not do that, we can be short of sleep. But then we will have a device that will help us actually catch up, which is sleepiness. So these are, uh, so whether it's sleepiness, or whether or not it's thirst, or whether it's hunger, or whether it's um, heat and cold regulation mechanisms, in other words, we're designed by nature with exquisite machinery mm -hmm. that actually tells us what to do. These are signals from our ancestors. They are shadows of forgotten ancestors that made all the right moves. And so the law of satiation is simply that all animals by nature will, if they're in their natural habitat eating their natural food, they'll eat the right amount of food over time. They're not gonna re there's no such thing as eating exactly the right amount of food for today. You're gonna overshoot it a little bit, you're gonna undershoot a little bit, but what happens is you have exquisite machinery that is monitoring this process um, and will balance this out perfectly over time, just as your breathing is. Mm -hmm. And so the only reason why people struggle with their weight is because they are actually eating foods that are not natural uh, to their environment. And as a result, when we shift people to natural foods, the problem of excess weight goes away. And so will, does willpower have anything to do with that? Willpower is, uh, we don't want to be using willpower to try to eat less than our satiation mechanisms are telling us. In other words, so when people typically go on a diet, what happens is, is that they think that what they need to do is eat less than they want. It's That's awful. a cruel mistake. I've lived in that world for yes, many years. It's that, awful. This is, this is the world of beautiful actresses and models, and they're, they're trying to uh, essentially override their biology, as well as the, the common uh, woman and man who is so frustrated uh, with their bodies that, they, that they're essentially, they know in principle that if they just eat less, that they'll lose weight. But this is actually not the solution. The solution is to obey the law of satiety, which is that if a creature eats the food of its nature, it can eat it to satiety and it will be of ideal weight. And that, that is what will happen. 
It does. So, so we just need to move people to healthier food, and then the problem will fade away. What are the myths of moderation? Everyone's favorite term when it comes to eating bad foods and any bad habit, for that matter. Yes, this is... Um, uh, the myths of moderation are that, that a little bit uh, isn't necessarily a problem. Now, the thing is, is that that isn't necessarily true. So when we look at the pleasure trap more broadly, we're just not looking about food. We're looking about everything. Mm -hmm. We're looking at all supernormal stimuli. So we know that depending upon who you are, sometimes a little bit of a supernormal stimuli can be the difference between life and death. So uh, a person who has a heroin addiction or a methamphetamine addiction, mm -hmm. uh, this a little bit can be, can be the uh, essentially a, a cascading avalanche of incentive that will take them down to a very dark place. So, and the same thing is true in alcohol. So we will not tell people that uh, only about 5% of people have the genetics hmm. to, to be addicted to alcohol. 95% of people, it's never a problem. But the 95% of people don't actually have the insight or intuition as to what it's like to be one of the 5%. And if you're one of the 5%, it's very difficult. Um, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult to achieve any kind of drinking in moderation. And so the myth of moderation uh, as applied to food is that for some people, that isn't a good solution. Now you can see uh, what I just talked about, the ego trap before, but what we actually have is we have two opponent processes here that are actually very difficult to negotiate. So, and they're actually counter processes and it, is, it just so happens that in nature, um, the, the way this is unfolded is completely unnatural. And the reason why is that the pleasure trap is an unnatural phenomenon. It was never supposed to be here. We were never supposed to have to choose between the richest, tastiest food and our survival. Uh, or our well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, it was always the case that the richest, tastiest, more exciting food was the best for our survival. That is no longer true. The, the ego trap is the problem of setting the bar too high. So if we set the bar too high at perfection, then what happens is, you, if you do this, if you are all the way perfect with respect to the pleasure trap, then you've reduced the pull of the pleasure trap, but you've made the likelihood of failure extremely high. If you lower the bar so low that all you say is what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna eat a banana for breakfast better than I am now and I'm gonna leave all the bacon and eggs and all the rich food. Uh, so I lower the bar so low that I can achieve it. So I'm not in the ego trap, but now I'm still in the pleasure trap. Mm. So now my taste buds and my palate will not encourage me consistently to healthy food. So these two things actually wind up being opponent processes. If you lower the bar too low, you're too far on the pleasure trap. If you put the bar up too high, you start to push into the ego trap. For every individual, there's a sweet spot. And the sweet spot to me is um, you need to be able to feel good and you need to continue to enjoy natural food. But you, that's where you need to be, uh, in, in a place where you feel like that you can do this and a place that you can sustain. Please help explain what dopamine, serotonin, and endorphins are their functions and how they relate to the pleasure trap? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a huge question, and I would say that uh, oh, there's version, about a version. thousand neuroscientists with, that would love to be able to explain this. Um, the truth is, is that the, the mind is exceedingly complicated, and uh, we've, we've actually identified maybe 60 neurotransmitters, and we suspect that there's over 300. So the functioning of the mind is sufficiently complex that I am not going to sit here and tell you that I know what serotonin does because nobody knows. <laughs> the, um, I what, asked my father, and he's a biologist, yes. and he went into like the, the way that everything's made up, and I'm like, Dad, I just want to know what it does. <laughs> <laughs> Give me that quick answer. Yeah. Okay. So the show quick me the picture and what it looks like. <laughs> sure, we'll draw a couple lines yeah. to, to he things. He did, he did that too. Sure. <laughs> the, uh, the truth is, is that the one we're most interested in, and one, the one we're most worried about, is dopamine. Mm -hmm. uh, dopamine is clearly the, the engine and the main chemical signaling mechanism for pleasure. It's the, um, also endorphins also are there, but dopamine causes what we're going to call an excited euphoria. It actually encourages the organism to pursue something and to continue. So when you sit down to eat, uh, you're designed by nature, if you, you like the smell of food, that's activating the dopamine pathway. 
And what it's doing is uh, the, the anticipation of the pleasure is essentially attempting to close the distance between the stimuli and you. That's what it's trying to do. Hmm. So when you're, when you're with some handsome actor, it's doing the same thing, <laughs> okay? Same thing, it's trying to get you to close the distance between you and the stimuli. Mm. When things are dangerous, there's different neurochemistry uh, causing a different reaction. So if you open a jar in the refrigerator and it's something spoiled, it actually makes you mm. avoid it or increase the distance between you and the stimuli. Or if you jump in the water and you see a shark, you want to get out of the water to, to reduce. So essentially, the way biology works, it works on approach versus avoidance mechanisms. So you have psychological experiences that are being caused by neurotransmitter cascades that, are, that cause you to feel things. And so what dopamine does is it says, close the distance, close the distance, close the distance. That's what it's trying to do, okay? It's like clues in a treasure hunt. And so for food, um, what it's doing is it's saying, keep eating. Okay, this is really good. Now, later on, after you've eaten, you'll have another experience of a relaxed euphoria called, that's endorphins. That's, uh, it's actually analogous to, during sexual activity, that's dopamine. It's like saying, keep going, keep going, keep going. The moment of orgasm is endorphin rush. It's an endorphin storm. So these two things work together. And so dopamine is the main one that, that we're actually worried about because it's, it's the anticipatory mechanism and during the process, uh, the pleasure pathway, also known as the dopamine pathway in your mind, is saying, keep going, keep going. That's how we're designed. The problem is, is that the modern food supply has made those signals acute. It's intensified them. So you can see how this would be a problem. If you make it more intensive than it's supposed to be, then you're gonna get a more intensive reaction out of the animal. It's going to eat past normal satiety mechanisms because it's gonna blow right past them because the system is essentially being lit on fire. And that's the problem of the pleasure trap, and that's why we try to get people to go back to nature. Let's talk about the psychological effects of eating animals. Mm -hmm. Does what and who we eat make a difference in how we feel emotionally? In your opinion, how much does it contribute to mood disorders like anger, anxiety, depression, and aggression? I think what, is, what happens is, is that these things can, can cause emotional issues if you know. If you're in the know and you actually have understood and come into contact and have you had your consciousness raised, that you understand that, that a living being has experienced pain and death as a result of what it is that you're eating, then I think all of these things tr are true. In other words, you you're, could, could very well have turbulence in your mind and cognitive dissonance about what it is that you're doing. Uh, and eventually the atherosclerosis uh, will cause damage in their mind. So if you were to take a CAT scan, uh, people that are 50 years old in the United States, you will find thousands of little tiny black dots on that scan. And what those, uh, what those are is they're little tiny miniature strokes. Wow. And so they're slowly losing their IQ. And those are like tiny little earthquakes that are, that are essentially signaling of a possible major earthquake to come. The discomfort and the, uh, the self-esteem issues that come with not, not being fit, as well as the, the poor circulation generally that results in not sharp mood states, not sharp thinking, fatigue, also the diversified pain, also the disease processes that have just major constant chronic influence on the person's well-being. These things are all absolutely directly related to poor diet, of which the main component of that poor diet is going to be animal food. Let's talk about unhealthy addictions. This mm -hmm. is kind of a long question, so come with me for the ride. Mm -hmm. um, and how to break free. Specifically, some addictions like the standard American diet filled with junk food and processed meats, mood-altering drugs, and porn. In mm -hmm. most cases, we need more and more of the addiction substance, more often and more hardcore, intense versions, mm -hmm. just to feel normal. Then in comparison, people, activities, and food that are good for us seem less interesting. Mm -hmm. Can brain pathways move in healthier directions away from cycles of addiction, and if so, how? Yes, they can and they will, and it's inevitable that they will. So the, the issue is, is that uh, the way nerves work is that they, they become, they are set sort of a, at a normal level of sensitivity for a normal level of stimulation that comes into the organism. But if, we, if the intensity of the signal from the outside, in this case, for example, when we massively increase the concentration of sugar, fat, and salt in the diet, 
uh, or we use some chemical altering substances, some drug. If we do those things, then what's going to happen is the, the senses are effectively going to become dulled. There's a reason for that. Uh, they're essentially defending themselves against hyperstimulation. So they will become dulled, they will become desensitized is what's going to happen. And therefore, the experience of a normal substance uh, in comparison will, will feel flat. So this is, um, well, let's just say if you go into somebody's house at, at Christmas time and you smell the Christmas tree, it smells fantastic. Mm -hmm. the, uh, but then after you've been there for a while, you can't smell it. That's a, that's a case of your senses becoming essentially dulled to that stimulus that is, that is at a higher than normal level of concentration than you would even find in the forest. So that, that's how it's going to work. Now that doesn't, hasn't done any damage, it will go back, you okay. see. So okay. the same thing is true of, of eating a very rich diet. If you eat a very rich diet, you've had done so your whole life. If you try to make the change to a healthy diet, it's going to be, feel like a sacrifice. It will. For how it, long? Um, the chemical census studies will tell us that you can get a, essentially a totally natural palate in about four months. Now, the truth is that's not linear. So you're going to do a tremendous amount. You'll probably go halfway in, in two weeks. So you'll, you'll be in quite good shape in two weeks, and then you'll continue to gain sensitivity. I wish I could tell you more about what these curves really look like, uh, but I can just tell you, well, we are doing the original research on that. Nice. Currently uh, at True North Health Center. So we That's are- exciting. Yeah, we will now, we, we're gonna learn here in the next year or two what these recovery curves actually look like. You're gonna have to come back. And yes. Talk to me about this. But I would, I would point out the following, some things that we see even with um, major brain changes that have taken place between major drugs, which is they're way heavier on the brain, way more impactful than the taste centers with respect to food, and that would be alcohol. Notice that uh, th there's a reason why a 30-day chip in AA is a very big deal. Mm. And that's because after 30 days, if you've made it through 30 days, you've gone through a substantial portion of recovery. Now we know it's really tentative and you are still in trouble and you're still gonna have major cravings. But this is also why a one-year chip is huge. Because if you can actually get through that year, you have done a substantial amount of recovery to the sensitivity of the mind of the brain for normal dopamine level stimulation. Life is starting to feel normal. Now it's not as good as it's going to get, okay? It's still gonna be recovering more for the next couple of years. And it will probably take about three years for things to be all firing on all cylinders again. With alcohol. With alcohol. But after a year, we're in pretty good shape, okay? And the same thing is true after two or three weeks of healthy food, you're in pretty good shape. You're, you actually like the healthy food, you're feeling better, things are moving in the right direction, all is getting better. Now, are you shaky? Yeah, you're just shaky like someone who's been in AA for a year. Mm -hmm. But you are on your way. So the, the sacrifice and the, the determination and self-discipline is not at the level of major addiction. It's one whole notch down. It's there, it's not easy, and it's enough to trap us. But people should know that it is not the harrowing ride that some of these other challenges are, but it's what you know, but it has similar magnitude in terms of your health and happiness. How can one make eating a whole food plant-based diet and healthy living pleasurable so it's sustainable and exciting? Well, I would say this. Um, as I was just saying, it's it's probably a two or three week process mm -hmm. to sensitize your taste enough that you that you're gonna enjoy it quite well. And what will happen is that will continue. So one thing that that I actually want people to pay attention to is something that they wouldn't be looking for. And that is that, uh, and this is the key to actually sustaining this kind of a process. And that is to be looking for something that happens inside of us emotionally by the time you've gone, say, two weeks and you've done a very good job. And this is gonna be what I call the self-esteem mechanism. You have inside of you an internal audience that watches you. Mm -hmm. So before you, step in front of a camera, you step in front of the mirror and see what you look like. And uh, when you're gonna have people over, you look at your house and you fix it up and you put flowers around and you, you look at the house through the eyes of your guests. Mm. And then you think about what they are gonna think of you and what they're gonna say to you as a result of this. Uh, a young guy shooting baskets in his driveway, a young kid you know, is calling out the game as if he's in the NBA Finals. And when he makes his shot, he acts like the crowd is roaring. 
This is the internal audience. This is a extraordinary psychological device that is part of natural human evolution. And what this device is there to do is it's there to give us feedback on our rehearsals or our actions when no one else is looking. So that's why um, if you go into a store and try on new clothes, if it looks good, you feel good even though nobody has seen you in the clothes. Mm. This is your internal audience. The internal audience is actually key to whether or not people stick on a healthy pathway and they make any healthy changes or with respect to any goals that they do. People are naturally designed to be looking for the end point or the outcome of their goals. So if someone that wants to lose 100 pounds is thinking that the key to them feeling better about themselves in their life is the moment when they're 100 pounds lighter and they can wear different clothes and what other people will be saying and feeling then. So that is what drives them. What they're looking for is the actual esteem from real live other people later. That is the goal that motivates them. That is not the goal that I want them to pay attention to. There is a shadow goal that is actually the key to this whole problem. And that is that, that um, you don't have to wait for a year and 100 pounds to feel better. It turns out that you will feel much better about yourself in two weeks. This is an extraordinary and important secret in psychology, and this is what I call esteem dynamics. Mm -hmm. That we tend to think of self-esteem as a static issue that came about from how we were treated by our children or whether the, the cute girls liked us in junior high school. <laughs> That's what we tend to be thinking. But it turns out that self-esteem is actually not this. The, um, what self-esteem is, is it's the internal audience giving us feedback and judging us on what have our actions been like in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that, that what they are is they're very much like, um, they're like the manager of a car wash. That if you're the owner operator of a car wash, and let's suppose you had a young kid named Jimmy, and he was a very good detailer, but he was a flake. So sometimes he showed up and sometimes he didn't show up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he showed up late and sometimes he showed up on time. And you would be very frustrated with him and if you were the owner and you would say, listen, you know, I might just quit on you. I might just fire you and just forget it. And this is exactly what the internal audience will sometimes tell the person. Like, you know what? You're not gonna do it. You're a failure. Just forget the whole thing. That's so sad. No, it's very sad, okay? And so what we have to watch here is that if the following takes place, let's suppose Jimmy picks up on this and, and the owner says, listen, if you would do a good job, I'd make you head of the detail division, okay? Well, let's suppose that Monday morning, Jimmy shows up on time. The owner operator's first reaction is, whatever, grab a towel. He's not impressed at all. Yeah. So the kid has done something good, but there's no positive feedback. There's no, there's no big cascade of positives at all. There's no encouragement. There's actually a low-grade disgust that I don't trust you. This is exactly what happens when people start to make, uh, make a healthy move in life, is that their internal audience doesn't trust them because it's known that they have fumbled the ball 40 times previously. So if Jimmy shows up the second day on time, still not impressed. Third day, still not impressed. Shows up Thursday and Friday, there starts to be a little internal pause that the owner operator thinks, nah, first time I've ever seen, you know, it's the first time I've seen this in a long time, well, but I'm not impressed, mm -hmm. okay? And he tells his wife, you know what? That kid isn't gonna show up on Monday morning. I know he's not. But next Monday he does. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, two weeks. What's gonna happen is the owner is gonna go home and he's gonna say to his wife, something has changed, okay? I don't trust him. I think he may not show up on Monday, you know what I mean? And I'm upset about it now. It's like, it's, he's starting to break my heart because I feel like he won't do it, but he might do it. Mm. When Jimmy shows up at nine o'clock on Monday morning, the reaction is gonna be, hi, Jimmy. It's gonna be excited. That's what's gonna happen to people as they do a good job that what's gonna happen is the internal audience is going to start to believe in them, okay? Long before anybody else has seen 100 pounds lost, 
long before there's any new clothes and any new fancy anything. Yeah. The internal audience will have observed this process and will start to change the neurochemical cascade of self-esteem. That is what they need to look for, okay? If they look for that and understand that this is an inevitable byproduct of excellence for even a short period of time, then this is the cascade that will chain the process together that will make their success uh, much more possible. You don't have to have won the game already to feel good. You have to just know that you are winning and that you can do it. And that's how that works. What makes people's reactions and coping mechanisms differ so drastically to the same situation? So say if two twins went through um, a horrible, I don't know, situation when they were young. Mm -hmm. Name it, you name it, I don't right. know, something horrible. Yeah. One would, would um, survive and thrive off mm -hmm. of that and one would be a victim mm -hmm. for life. Now why, what, in your opinion, what is it that causes somebody to take something um, whether being overweight or whether struggling with food or whatever struggles that they're going through and turn that around and it's easier for some people to thrive and harder for some people yes. to. So yes, there's more, more than one thing. So the, the story of the pleasure trap is actually the story of how subtle situational factors can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So we now have people that are smarter and better educated than ever before but they live in a food environment that is more tricky and, and trap-filled. Mm -hmm. So as a result, they're struggling more than they've, ever, than they've ever struggled because the situation has changed. The same thing is true when someone starts to try to make a change. Who else is in their life? Who is their social circle and how encouraging are they? That's an enormously important factor in determining how well people are gonna do. Mm -hmm. Also, I had one man that, um, that said, I understand all this and I know what to do, but the problem is I live right next door to 7-Eleven and it's open all night. And I can just walk over in my, my pajamas and get an ice cream sandwich. <laughs> I said, well, you're gonna have to move. You're gonna have to sell your house and move because Did he that's, move? what's that? Did he move? Yes, no. he had to. The point is there's no way that this is gonna work. You can't be an alcoholic tending bar. You can't be someone who is trying to have a healthy diet and, and work at you know, a pizza place. Yeah. This is not gonna fly. So you, uh, what I explain to people is that we must pay more attention and work harder on our environment than we do on ourselves. Your, your question is a deep one for psychology, and that is that how much does situation impact us and how much is just personal character? Mm. Your, um, your personality is really not subject to change. That is natural, it's natural to you, it's natural to the individual variation in genetics. The, uh, that's just how that works. So we can't make someone who's, who is, say, open and adventurous and wants to try everything in the world and isn't very conscientious and real social and real agreeable, that person is gonna have a lot of problems with this. Somewhere in there we need some conscientiousness, which we usually have. Anyone who's interested at all is usually pretty conscientious. Um, then people differ in how open they are and how, how much they need wide stimulation. People that need wide stimulation need to have a wider repertoire of healthy foods and treats for them to coming their direction. Mm -hmm. These are the issues of personality. So personality is a, is a major issue. I actually have a, a little uh, slideshow and lecture I've given called The Perfect Personality. Mm, okay. There's a perfect personality for healthy living and nobody has it. <laughs> Except my good friend Alan, my co-author. <laughs> he's the only one. The, uh, I have to meet so, him. Sure, <laughs> he, he's, he's no fun, let me tell you. Oh. And so, uh, oh, no. <laughs> it's the way it is. <laughs> the, uh, but he has the perfect personality. He has a perfect personality for healthy living. Okay. He, he's disagreeable, so oh, if anybody no. ever asks him, would you, would you like some? No, Oh Why no. Because I don't want to get sick and die, okay? <laughs> Do you want anything new and different? No, okay. Does he want I would to, love him. Sure. He sounds like he sounds like a great person. Does he want to travel and see what all the world's food is? No, he doesn't want to travel. No. He doesn't want to leave California. <laughs> <laughs> so some people have the perfect personality, some people don't. And so yeah. most of us don't, and it opens us up for some vulnerabilities. The, uh, within those vulnerabilities, what we need to do, rather than working on ourselves, we need to work on our environments. So our Smart. environments, we need a way to work on our environment is to know how we're gonna manage social situations that are gonna come up. That is effectively not changing our personality, but it's, it's help, helping us become more effective at managing our environment. What are we gonna say when they say, 
oh, come on, just one. Wouldn't you like just one? We need to be ready. Uh, we need to be ready for these sorts of problems and organize our lives in such a way that healthy living is a lot easier uh, for us. And that's how we, get, that's how we do it. What, would be, what is one thing you say? Say if I said, um, have this, I don't know, um, pork chop. Oh, not say? just now, maybe later. You say maybe sure, later? Sure, maybe later. Just, okay, just punt the ball down the field one round. Wow. Okay? They'll come back around, we punt it again. Okay? They come back a third time and get insistent. Then we're going to say something like, no, I'm just kind of on a, on a healthy kick right, right at the moment, so I'm going to pass right now. Okay. No problem. We just dance around these things and move on. Okay. Yes. Depends on what mood I'm in. Sometimes Depends. they'll be like, you're an animal killer! <laughs> yes. There's, 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 these are different personalities. Yeah, John, yeah. John McDougall would never do no, what I he say. Never. No, never. He calls that Doug Lyle's wimpy way. That's... <laughs> <laughs> but it, it helps a lot of people. But you know what? Sometimes you have to be peaceful. Sure. And professional. Sure. So that's a good way to do that. How much sleep do we need for optimal health and why? This is an open question. And the first place we look is to the mechanisms of satiety. So in the same way that you need to breathe a certain amount, in the same way you need to drink a certain amount, uh, the same way you need to sleep a certain amount. And it's going to change from day to day depending upon what's happening in your life. Uh, what we do know is that people are chopping into that. And we, we know they are. The electric light bulb has essentially lengthened the day artificially, and it's made it so that people are sleeping less than they had before. And as a result of that, we know they're tired, and when they're tired, they use coffee, and they use coffee in order to block the signal of sleepiness. That's what coffee does. That's what caffeine That's does. my next question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the, uh, there's a particular uh, neurochemical that is the mechanism that signals sleepiness, and a coffee or caffeine literally goes in and blocks the action of that chemical. It's as if you have a sprained ankle and we take cortisone and we, we knock it up so that you can't feel it. That's what that's doing. So, but in answer to your question more broadly, there's been considerable disagreement uh, among sleep scientists about this. The most recently interesting research was pu uh, published uh, by Hunter College showing that in, in looking at hunter-gatherers directly out there in the field, mm -hmm. surprisingly, they only sleep, the adults sleep about seven hours a night, which is less than I would have thought. Um, wow. I, I was actually surprised. Previous research has shown that hunter-gatherers might sleep as much as nine. So I think that what we see is that we see an open question. They must have had fires and, and other things for yes. light because that's not, I mean, it's dark more than nine hours. Oh, yes. Actually, we know uh, that it's very likely that people slept in shifts. So that there's- On the lookout. Yes, there's con uh, considerable genetic differences uh, between early birds and night owls. And so uh, I'm a night owl. Me so too. I, yes, so I'll stay up late. And the, uh, you can imagine the early birds going to bed early and then waking up early. So this is how human beings covered each other from predators, uh, by essentially having a, a distribution of, of early birds versus night owls essentially covering us. Uh, standing guard. So one's not more healthy than the other? No. Because everybody always says, if you are you want to get more done and be more productive, then wake up early and... Early bird talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Er, 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 early bird arrogance. That's what that is. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. What are some adverse effects of coffee and caffeinated beverages, yes. and why should we avoid it? And what can we do so we don't need them, other than you know sleeping more? Yeah. Um, I think one problem is night owls in this society have it a little tougher mm -hmm. because they're gonna stay up late and yet the work day starts early and so they're more likely to wind up short of sleep mm -hmm. and they're gonna wind up then, then getting dragged into caffeine. Mm -hmm. So the, the long-term effects are, I think that we're gonna see these as pretty minor. Now, this is what I call one of the minor sins. The, um, it's not as, it's not, having a cup of coffee a day isn't in the same class of eating eating a third of your calories from animal food every day. It's, uh, but it's, it's sort of like little scratches in your car door. You know, if someone just every now and then opens their car door into your car door and causes a little tiny scratch, then after a few years, we got more scratches. Yep. And so uh, the sleep science says that, that we are much better off essentially sleeping to satiety consistently and making it a priority. How can we successfully, peacefully, and powerfully convince others to make good choices like a whole food plant-based diet and taking a path supportive to true health and happiness? Well, I think that um, that's such a, 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 it's a big and beautiful question. And I think that the, the answer that I've seen 
is that this is a story that will be told uh, by many people in many different ways. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the, whether it's the, the uh, athletes that are coming, coming out now more often and, and telling us the story that, that when they eat more healthfully and they keep animal food out of their diet, they recover more quickly. Mm. This is a beautiful thing to watch. Um, it's, also, it's also good when we have our grand old scientists that show that the rank and file uh, members of the society can reverse uh, really debilitating disease processes and reclaim their lives. Uh, and it's also uh, when, when younger people and young, young and, and happening people can tell the story mm. in a way that reaches the youth. Yeah. And also from different angles, whether it's for, from personal health or environmental concerns or absolutely from animal rights. All of these are different components of the story. And as we keep telling the story in the different ways, uh, what's gonna happen is that people need to often hear the message more than once, sometimes from a different perspective, and then it cumulatively winds up impacting and causing a, a raising of consciousness and change. So I think that uh, as I look at, at the march of, of history and knowledge of people, I see how far we've come in just the last hundred years about how we think about each other mm -hmm. and how we treat each other as people uh, and our differences. This is sort of another major um, challenge for humans. And I believe, I won't be here to see it, but I believe a hundred years from now, they will look back on how it is that we eat and how it is that we have treated the animals and the environment, and they'll, they'll shudder and feel like it was practically medieval. And we're gonna to continue to share this message for as long as we can and as well as we can. Uh, but we should be heartened by the fact that everything is moving in a good direction. And that's, that's where we take our, our inspiration from. Thank you. And I, I want to share one more passage from your book, The Pleasure Trap. Mm -hmm. This book is so per in perfect condition because I audio listen to it and it's available on <laughs> Audible. And Dr., um, not Dr., Chef, Chef AJ, AJ um, is the um, voice of The Pleasure Trap. And she has a beautiful reading voice. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to read this passage from the book. The close proximity of large numbers of domesticated animals to humans led to plagues and pestilence. In fact, the most potent killers of humanity since the dawn of civilization have not been warfare, natural disasters, or starvation. They have been epidemics resulting directly from animal husbandry. The desire for meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and dairy products have been one of humanity's most dangerous desires. Absolutely. So thank you for being a voice for the animals, being a voice for our mental health, our physical health, and I'm so glad that you exist in this world. And thank you for being here with us. I, I really appreciate it. My great pleasure. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in. Love, Gianna. And Dr. Lyle.